Okay. Well, let's take a look. And maybe even before this, let's take a look at all the integrals that we've done. So, <coughs> going to backtrack and and um, I always like to start with the uh, with the uh, single integral. And then I started to change my notation. Instead of going from A to B, I just say I as an interval between A and B. And then there is uh, the double integral over a domain. And then there's a triple integral over a solid. And then for each of the double and triple integrals, we're integrating over an area element or a volume element, so we call it A and B. And that seems to work out OK. And then I think last time I put special cases for these, a special case if f is equal to 1. These are scalar functions here. So 1 is a valid scalar function. It's a constant function. So if f is equal to 1, then we have the length or the area or the volume. And we saw already that this idea comes in handy. So instead of going through the calculations of the integral integrating things we just stopped and found volumes by geometry <clears throat> so from here we came up with new types of integrals that don't integrate over a nice one-dimensional or two-dimensional or three-dimensional, one-dimensional line or interval, two-dimensional region or three-dimensional volume. Uh, we looked at a one-dimensional integral that integrated over a one-dimensional object, like in this case a, a curve, that could be integrated in two or three dimensions. And then we decided that we can put a scalar function or a vector field in there, right? So if we put a scalar function, we're integrating over the arc length. And this is what we call our path integral. And then we also extended this path to a surface instead of just a single curve, we looked at a two-dimensional surface in three-dimensional space, and then we call this a surface integral. <clears throat> and just like these ones before, the line uh, before the path and surface integrals, uh, there's a special case where your function, your scalar function, is equal to 1. And so we got the arc length for the first one and the surface area for the second one. we should give this name to
And then from here, uh, we decided that we can't get enough of these integrals, so instead of integrating over a scalar, well, let's integrate over a vector field. <coughs> but now we can't just say ds the arc length. We have to say ds some direction vector. And this is what we called our line integral. And then the equivalent double integral for that is our flux. <clears throat> okay. So in the future, remember that sometimes when you see a path integral, people also call that a line integral. So just be careful about the, the wording and notation. And then sometimes the flux integral is also seen as a surface integral, so they just call it a surface integral without saying flux. But they do have relations. <coughs> so in terms of going through this directly, when you look at a path integral, you have to somehow change that into a single integral somehow so that you can do the calculations. Or if you have a surface integral, somehow that will become a double integral so that you can do the calculations. This is not using any of the theorems yet, but just to go through a straightforward calculation, we need to know how that changes. So let's take a look at how that changes. We'll start with a path integral. <clears throat> so for a path integral, you got a scalar function dot ds. That's at least the notation that we use. I'm sorry, not the dot, but just multiplied. And so for this, we're going to assume that r parameterizes c. And when you do a parameterization, you're interested, whenever you do a parameterization, you're always going to be interested in the domain that would cover the parameterization that you have. So I'll just give it an interval A to B. And so the working definition for this will become uh, the <coughs> function. And then we have to put the parameterization into the function. That means R which consists of x and y, or x, y, z. You'll take the x, y, z from r and put it into f. And so uh, I denote that by using r of t that goes composed with f of t. Okay. What that really means is that you're going to put x of t in for x, y of t in for y, and z of t in for z. And then this is a times, and I'll make the little dot smaller than a dot product. So, <clears throat> And then you're going to multiply this by the magnitude of the derivative, the arc length element. So it almost translates directly that the ds is equal to r prime, the magnitude of r prime dt. And then based on your parameterization, depending on how you parameterize this, you have your limits A and B here. <clears throat> so this is how your theoretical path integral becomes an actual working integral that you can evaluate. The line integral comes in several forms now. The line integral, as I stated from earlier, is defined or looks like uh, a vector field dotted with ds, where s is some other vector. 
but sometimes you may see it slightly differently. You may see it as uh, a line integral of p dx plus q dy, and I'll just go three dimensions here because this could be in 2 or 3D. <clears throat> And let's just say, if you're looking at this in 2D, then this last term would not be here. So your line integral can look in one of these two forms initially, but you eventually want a working definition for this. So the working definition for this, using this F notation, dot ds, or maybe I'll put it down here, <clears throat> it will be an integral where you have this parameterization. Basically the same as the path integral. You take your vector field and then you evaluate your vector field using the parameterization. And then you're going to dot it. Now this is an actual dot product because you're going to dot it with the vector that you get when you take the derivative of your parameterization, which is a vector. So the ds with the arrow on it <coughs> is equal to r prime of tbt. The ds without the arrow on it is a magnitude of r prime dt. Okay? So I think that's the best way to look at it. And then if you are working with it using this notation, you can also think of this as uh, the P. And, and then you have to evaluate this at the R prime, or not the R prime, but the R. But the DX is X prime. And this is basically this, this notation that's taking the dot product. <coughs> looks like a P. Okay. <coughs> yeah. How did you this is like the DS for each of the the cutlass formula? Mm-hmm. How is that related to the integral? Yeah. So what they said was the integral of the magnitude of r prime of t dt was the arc length. All right? And then they said, hey, if this is parameterized by arc length, why don't we just call this ds? And that's the one that sits in here as arc length. If you have one for the integrand with a ds, then that is in fact the arc length. So that's basically what they're saying. When they say they parameterize by arc length, that's that's the ds that they're looking at. <coughs> so parameterizing by arc length is a special case where they really um, did that for theoretical reasons to prove things. And doing, doing the parameterizing by arc length practically is not a, an easy thing to do, not necessarily. I mean, it's easy if you have computers because the computer is going to do all the work. But it could be really tedious for somebody who's trying to parameterize by arc length. But we don't care about doing that. Okay. So this is how you would negotiate your your line integral. If you have to do a line integral and you know you, you check the theorems and say, okay, now bottom line now is I have to do the work to find the line integral. So this is how you would punch a line integral in. 
Okay, questions? All right, let's go to the double integrals. Starting with a surface integral. And the surface integral at first glance would look like this, but this doesn't make much sense to us until we actually work it out. So what we need to do is we need to parameterize your S, the surface. using some parameterization phi. And I hope that you guys have messed around with programs enough to, to see that u and v is really the most popular, <coughs> popular, popular independent variables they use for parameterizations. But you can definitely use r, theta, x, and y. <coughs> and then Depending on how you parameterize, you're going to integrate over a domain, and if your domain happens to be a circle, then you need to somehow negotiate that. But a lot of times, we would like our domain to be just uh, constants. <coughs> so what happens here is that this, this sigma has an x and a y and a z component, and then each of these x, y's, and z's are both are all functions of two, the two variables that you're looking at. <clears throat> so when you translate this symbol, symbolic notation for surface integral to actually something that you can work with, <clears throat> your surface integral becomes a double integral and your f has to the x, y's and z's that are in your function f has to change with uh, respect to your parameterization so that it all becomes u's and v's and then you're going to multiply that by the ds component and the ds component like the d little s from the previous page where it's the magnitude of the derivative, this would be magnitude of the <coughs> normal vector. So it's the two-dimensional equivalent of using up derivatives. <coughs> and I would put dA here, uh, but it's a du, dV in any order that is more appropriate. However, we want to integrate with over that domain. <coughs> oh, so by the way, let me go back <coughs> over here where the ds component for the path integral uh, has a magnitude which means whatever that's going to be is going to be positive. The ds component for the line integral does not have a magnitude. And if you're parameterizing through a curve, that curve can go in one of two directions. And so that whether it's going one way or going the other way, it's going to give you a different, uh, a different answer. So in this case, oh, I forgot to put the a, b here also. <coughs> in this case, because there is no absolute value here and the direction will matter. <coughs> so when you're doing a line integral, the problem should state the specific orientation. Where are you going from to where? so that uh, you can establish an appropriate orientation. And if your parameterization happens to be going the other way, then you know that that's just uh, going backwards and you just throw a negative sign. <coughs> so this is your surface integral. Now if you're going to look at the flux, it 
This is where orientation is going to matter as well. But it's going to be the same setup, and it's really, really comparable to your line integral. It's your vector field evaluated at the components of your parameterization. And then dotted now without the absolute value, without the magnitude, you're dotting with a normal. By the way, I forgot, sometimes they, they denote this uh, slightly differently. They denote the flux integral dotted with your n ds. And this calculation sometimes comes in handy, um, where n is the unit normal coming out of your surface. And again, the normal has two directions, so this has a specific orientation. <coughs> So if we want to think about it this way, this is your f evaluated at your um, parameterization. <coughs> dotted with well, the unit normal is still the cross product. But it's divided by the magnitude. So following along with the notation that they have there, this is your n, and so your ds is the same ds as it was before. So sometimes they they write it they write your flux integral like this, but really it all just boils down to that thing dotted with a cross product. And this comes in handy when a lot of times comes in handy when you're looking at a nice normal vector, like if it's a disk or or a flat plane where the normal is just pointing one direction, the i, j, or the k, or negative i, j, k then it, this is a nice uh, formula to, to try to remember so that you can, <coughs> you can then two zeros there. I, J, K has zeros and two components, so that's going to wipe out a bunch, of, uh, a bunch of components and two components in your vector field. So that, that might be a nice move as we've seen before. To make it a unit normal, that's what this little n stands for. The like this? Okay. <coughs> Depending on your parameterization, your your cross products might not always be unit length. And in fact, they may change depending on what u and v you're evaluating over. So um, this, this form of the flux just says you want, for, you want the normal vector to be the same all the time. Yeah? Yeah, everything so far, we have to just mandatory to the uh, Not necessarily. We saw a couple problems. You know, Caesar was always saying, why, why do we need to parameterize can we just use X and Y as your standard parameterization? And uh, for those cases, you're not you're kind of parameterizing, but not really. <clears throat> so you can say yes uh, for every single occasion you need to parameterize if you want to call that a, a parameterization. <clears throat> okay. Yeah, 
And I think we've seen enough times that that might be the easier way to go most of the time. Because parameterizing and doing this crossy stuff <laughs> could be a lot more difficult than we would anticipate. You know, versus leaving it at just X and Y. Crossy and dotty stuff. <laughs> yeah? So, does it work out that if you parameterize first in terms of R and beta, you don't need to include the R? Yes. So, if you do parameterize, if you decide that you want to parameterize first <coughs> and then do your work this way, when you parameterize first and do your work this way, uh, anytime you take this cross product or even this cross product with the magnitude, those things, those things <laughs> uh, in, in uh, 1510 that we didn't study, um, the Jacobian pops up in this cross product. So um, if you decide from the beginning that you want to parameterize us using the polar coordinate parameterizations, um, you'll come up with that R here so you don't have to add on, tack on that extra R because you're not, when you parameterize using R and theta, your integral will be in R and theta already and you don't need to change variables like, like you would normally do going from X, Y to R theta. It's already changed for you so this, this cross product will reveal your your um, Jacobian, yeah. Same goes for uh, rho squared sine theta. Same goes for spherical coordinates, yeah. Although in spherical, we don't parameterize in spherical coordinates. We kind of parameterize in spherical coordinates, but we only parameterize usually with respect to phi and theta, because when we're talking about surfaces, we don't. It's a surface. Think of a surface as a two-dimensional figure in 3D. Think of a piece of paper, actually think of a rubber sheet that you're gonna lift up in space and then poke in certain ways to make a surface shape of it. And then, and then that's gonna be your surface. Surface is essentially two-dimensional that's in three-dimensional space. So <clears throat> it's, not, it's not 3D. It doesn't have a, uh, a, a solid component to it. It's just a two-dimensional component. Yes, if you switch to polar before you parameterize, when you do this cross product, you're going to be guaranteed to come out with an R in there. Oh, the X, Y is the easier parameterization to go with. Then change, change uh, your variables. And yeah, that's when you have to come up because you didn't do it from the beginning. <coughs> so um, that might be worth another page. Let's take a look at parameterizing. So let's take a look at uh, sphere of x squared plus y squared plus z squared is equal to, um, I don't know, something. <clears throat> so this is, this is your sphere. Uh, I can think of three quick ways to parameterize this. Uh, parameterization number one. I'll keep the x, y component here. So this would be an x, a y, and then I would solve for the z here. And then now I'd, have, I'd be in a little bit of trouble because I, I'm only parameterizing the top half. 
So how is this easy? Um, well, if you do the x cross y, we've done this enough times there, you should know what the answer is, right? I don't know what the answer is. <laughs> <laughs> So uh, the, the x, if I integrate or take the derivative with respect to x, I get 1, 0, and the derivative of this with respect to x, right? <clears throat> so I think that's uh, uh, negative 2x divided by the square root of 4 minus x squared minus y squared. Oh, the two in this power would go away. Yes. <clears throat> and then the y would be 0, 1, and then negative y over the same thing. So when you cross it, uh, with respect to x, it's going to be negative. negative x over the square root 4 minus x squared minus y squared. Second one would be negative negative y over 4 minus x squared minus y squared. And then the last one is positive 1. Okay, so I, I kept the negative signs there because now I think I'm ready to generalize this and this is something that we probably should have done a long time ago that if, uh, if this is an x, a y, and f of x, y if you're able to solve for z by itself in your surface <coughs> then your cross product will end up being negative fx Notice that that's just a derivative of the function with respect to x, negative fy, and then positive 1. <clears throat> if you remember when we were talking about gradients, we had uh, fx, fy, and negative 1 as the direction of our normal vector. So here, it's just going the opposite way. And what more importantly, it's giving us a, a normal vector that's pointing upward. The z is positive the whole time. So uh, that's what that's doing. OK? Yeah? Um, okay, we'll see. <clears throat> All right, well, uh, let's, uh, let's try to do a different parameterization here, and this time let's use uh, polar coordinates. And then you can certainly go one more and use spherical coordinates, but I don't want to mess too much with that. And I'll just write down the thing. But let's, let's go in uh, deeper detail with uh, polar coordinates here so we can see the R that pops out. Oh, maybe I might be interested in doing <laughs> the spherical coordinates. Um, I guess it'll, it's going to be the same amount of work. Oh, one of the things when you parameterize, I keep telling you, but I keep forgetting to do, 
is to identify your domain <clears throat> so in this particular parameterization the first one that we did our domain is going to be a disk so this might be a nice normal for us to work with but we have to remember that when we integrate we'll still want to change variables to polar coordinates probably <clears throat> all right let's do this next parameterization if we parameterize using polar coordinates then we're already in polar coordinates uh, advantage of doing this is that our domain is nice and the disadvantage is um, the cross product is going to be a little bit of a pain Yeah. Because a sphere, radius two. Oh, so this should probably be four, huh? Is that right? Four. Yeah, it's four. <coughs> All right, uh, if you're parameterized in polar coordinates, your uh, phi sub r is going to be cosine phi or theta sine theta. And then this one would be, what is it, negative r, negative 2r divided by 2, something like that. Is that right? Take the derivative with respect to r now. Take the derivative with respect to theta. Minus r sine theta. Positive r cosine theta. And 0. So that the cross product will be minus r squared. Positive r squared. Cosine R? No, cosine theta. What? <laughs> Positive R squared cosine theta divided by 4 minus R. Uh, the middle term, 0, negative, negative, positive, negative. Be negative? Last term would be <coughs> cosine squared minus minus so cosine squared plus sine squared with an R just be an R sticking out I hope that's right <coughs> so uh, when you see that there's an R Coming out of this, that's the Jacobian R that we would have come out anyway. So we can take that R out, and then this be R cosine theta over square root of 4 minus R squared. And then here we have a negative R sine theta over 4 minus R squared. And then now you took the R out, so this is just 1. <coughs> So uh, <clears throat> the Jacobian comes out of this, so you don't need to add on or tack on another R. And then here you'll just have a, a messy looking cross product that you'll have to work with. And the unfortunate thing about this is that you don't have any nice zeros here. You do have a one at the end over here, so that when you take the dot product, you might, you might get lucky and may just have something that's kind of easy, but chances are you're working with a tough looking cross product. So I think uh, keeping the x and y, uh, just to put a name to this, I sometimes call this the graph parameterization. 
it, it keeps the x and y the same, and then the z is just whatever z is equal to in terms of x and y. Uh, this clearly is a polar parameterization. And because of the cross product, it's usually not um, a, not an advisable thing to do. Uh, it's usually better to work with this until you're ready to integrate. Uh, but if you want to see one more parameterization, just for you know for our exercises, for the sake of being able to graph it using uh, the 3D plotter or something, we can also plot this sphere or graph the sphere using polar parameterization. Spherical. <laughs> so spherical parameterization uh, we think of spherical coordinates with a row, right? Our row is our um, is our um, is our radius, or and then row measures the thickness as you go from <coughs> row equals to one thing to another. But here, since we're talking about a surface, the row is going to be fixed. In this case, the radius is two, so our row is going to be fixed, and so we just have to remember that that's going to be a row. So it's going to be 2, uh, whatever that is, sine, cosine, sine phi, cosine theta, 2 sine phi, sine theta, and 2 cosine phi. <coughs> and in this case, if you were to parameterize the whole sphere, then you probably want to do this because you want to be able to get the bottom part of the sphere as well. And this domain will handle that. Uh, since we're only taking a look at the top half of the sphere, I guess we can just let our phi go from 0 to pi over 2. So for this one, I definitely don't want to do the cross product. But I could tell you what comes out of the cross product. What, come out of, what comes out of the cross product is Jacobian that you would do when you change variables, which is what? Okay, and we don't have a row. What's row equal to? Row is a constant that's two. So that would come out of your, so you should have a four that would come out of this cross product somehow uh, if you were to be, if you were able to factor it out. Okay. All right, <clears throat> so yeah, that's this thing. Outward or inward normal kind of business? For the line? For the curve? Okay. <laughs> so cones are usually the best things to, to, to look at when you're talking about if I'm if I'm 
understanding your question um, correctly. <clears throat> um, so you're talking about the, the orientation from a surface to a curve. Well, you need to worry about your orientation for the surface for flux integrals. You need to worry about the orientation for your curves for line integrals. And you need to worry about your orientation for a surface to a curve if you're using Stokes' theorem. So there's kind of three things happening here. Yeah? It only limits what the flow of your field if you want to use Stokes' theorem, right? Or you would use Stokes' theorem if you're asked to take the curl of your field. Right. Okay. Yes. Right. <coughs> so let, let's take a look at orientation. <coughs> Cones are usually the best thing to look at. We can look at the parabolas, though. So let's um, let's take let's let's take a parabola paraboloid. Z is equal to. Uh, do we want an upward opening or a downward opening paraboloid? Okay. Downward opening paraboloid. So let's uh, let's give it a four minus x squared minus y squared as an example. And let's say it's above the x axis, xy plane, so let me keep, kind of keep it simple. <clears throat> so now from here, you can uh, come up with two orientations. You can say an upward orientation or a downward orientation. Let's maybe use a different color for that. <clears throat> and an upward orientation clearly would be something like this, or some people will call it outward, but <clears throat> and then a downward orientation would be, you know. You're pointing, you're inside of the paraboloid pointing downward. Um, <clears throat> I would say outward or inward if it was a closed surface. If it's not closed, saying outward or inward doesn't quite make sense. I mean, you can kind of. Um, you can kind of guess whether something's pointing inward or outward depending on the shape. So here you can kind of assume that uh, inward means downward in this case. This is not closed. Okay. So I, I would define outward and inward if it was a closed surface, so then it's clear which direction is outward and inward. Over here, it's kind of clear. It looks like this is the outside of the paraboloid, so that you're, you're, you're pointing outward. But uh, for, for these things, usually it's better to use the direction upward or downward. Or if it's opening along the y-axis, you can say it's op the normal is on the positive y or positive x, so that it's clear which way uh, these things are pointing. Okay, <clears throat> so um, we can parameterize it and determine if our parameterization falls in one of these categories, and then therefore uh, we can say if it's if we want it upward, our parameterization points down, then it's ORP, or if, if we want it upward and our parameterization points up, then that's good, it's OPP. Um, well, 
Well, we could we could parameterize it and then we can determine the orientation. Is that that is that the question? Yeah. Sure. Yes. Whatever. So let's let's do the simple parameterization. Let's do the graph parameterization where um, we'll keep the x and y the same variables that are there already. And then so the x is the x component, the y is the y component, and the z is the 4 minus x squared minus y squared. So the cross product, you remember, it's the derivative of the function with respect to x, negative, right? It's a negative, and then the derivative of this with respect to x, that looks like it's negative 2x, right? And then the second component is the derivative of this function with respect to y, negative. So the derivative of this function with respect to y is negative 2y. And then what's the last component? 1. And now this tells me that's my orientation. It's pointing up. Okay. So you're really only looking at your z value or the open the log positive y is the y. Yeah, so depending on which way they're telling you the, the normal vector should be pointing, uh, if it's opening up or down, you're looking at your z value, whether it's positive or negative. Or if it's pointing sideways, you're gonna look at whatever variable, whatever component it is, and it's positive or negative. Yeah. Why is there a negative? Because that's what always comes out when you do the graph parameterization. Okay? It's, it's easier to look at a curve because you can see where the curve goes in two dimensions. Or it, it, even in three dimensions, you can see the starting and ending point. Uh, so the direction of a curve, it's pretty clear whether you're going this way or the opposite way. But for a surface, you're not, you're kind of not looking at one or two directions this way. You're looking at a surface, and then you're looking at whether it's going out of the surface or into the surface, or whatever that means. Yeah, question? Yeah, I know. <laughs> I, uh, I don't think I can narrow it down. <laughs> <laughs> I usually like to have a no-no column. No-no? Have you guys heard of no-no column? Yeah. No-no? <laughs> no. Yeah. All right, everything. <laughs> oh, this is funny. <laughs> All right, let's build a list of no. <clears throat> I'm not going to give you a projectile problem. Do you want me to put it on this side? No. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Hello. Yeah. 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 Well, there won't be 
there won't be that kind of word problem. But the concepts behind, uh, how would we call that? Gradient? I'll say bees or ant problems. <laughs> well, gradients, you know, that's a big part. Level curves is, I don't know, that might be important. Osculating circles. So, um, yeah, I should have. <coughs> so, um, Well, I think chain rule is kind of embedded in a lot of these things, so. That's basic yeah. stuff. So the ant B stuff, you know, they have tangent planes and gradients. That doesn't mean that you are not going to have tangent planes and gradients here. This is just uh, specifically the ant and the B type problems where it's, I'm asking for these concepts in a convoluted, it wasn't that convoluted, <laughs> but in a semi-convoluted word problem. But I should be able to, you should be able to give me those pieces of information if it's not in you know this this weird situation. Yeah. Are there any word problems in general? Or is that slash like problem that can be explained? Yeah, that I'm not I, no. The flashlight problem has multiple parts and that's something where you, you just don't have enough time in, in the class to do it. So I won't put anything as heavy as a flashlight or the, even the rocket problems that we did. I, I don't know what that means. Um, <laughs> yeah, so I think the, the B and ant kind of problems are, is that, if that's what you mean by word problems, and the, and the baseball hitting thing, and somebody gets thrown off something and lands in the net of sharks yeah. or whatever, there won't be any, any of those convoluted word problems. But the concepts are, you know, provided that there are none of these concepts here, everything else, else uh, will be there. I, I hope they're straightforward. I think they're straightforward. Lagrange multipliers. What? Uh, I would call that under optimization, maybe. Yeah. Anything else? <laughs> differentials, they're kind of like tangent plane stuff. So I think if you know tangent planes and differentials, won't be a big stretch to go there. Like the, the volume of a, Oh, yeah, the, the differential word problems? Yeah. Yeah, I'm not going to put that there. Okay. 
Anything else that you guys want to eliminate? <laughs> what? <clears throat> you guys eliminated an awful lot there. <laughs> Moments? No. Center of mass. But mass is one of those applied to an integral problem, and that seems to be something that you should be able to do. Yeah, if you have a density function, you should be able to find the mass. No inertia. Do you guys have any homework on inertia? Okay, no inertia. So tomorrow, you should come with questions. I, I'm not going to have anything planned. I didn't have anything planned today. I, never had, <laughs> I, I didn't have anything planned for the whole semester. I was just <laughs> came here and started talking. Um, so what I'd like for you to do is try to come up with questions, either specific questions about uh, the review homework problems or something like that, or uh, specific questions about um, a, an old test problem, an old quiz problem, or an old homework problem that we can do if we, if we can, we'll, we'll do it. Uh, but aside from that, you know, it's just the review day. And no, we can cancel class if you want. No. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So, so come up with some questions for me, and then we'll we'll talk about more reviewing.